Hello, I'm Dr. Derek Keats, a former professor of biology, and I have a new topic for you today, and it's homeostasis. Uh, this is an interesting topic because it's all about how we maintain the optimal state of things in our bodies despite considerable pressure to change. Now, in this video, we're going to cover the notion of homeostasis, that is, maintaining a constant state or optimal in internal environment within our bodies or within cells. And we're going to look at the role played by negative feedback by reviewing glucose regulation and then talking about thermal regulation, how we regulate our body temperatures. Now, people who know me know that I love hiking. And I love hiking when there's a hill to climb. But man, hiking around Cape Town when the temperature is 30 degrees, you get so hot, you sweat like a pig. I also love the snow. And in my younger days, I used to cross-country ski a lot and sit around on the ice doing ice fishing. You get quite cold that way. I've even gone scuba diving under the ice and mm, played icebreaker with my butt. I've been dropped off by a helicopter in the middle of the Arctic pack ice and lived to talk about it. Now, I still love swimming as well, and even if the water is a little chilly. And then, thinking about it right now, it's a June morning in Johannesburg, and it's cold, probably three degrees. I'm shivering. Ugh. I'm also at the tail end of a winter flu, or cold. And last week, my body temperature increased by 1.5 degrees. It was a panic. I had to get an injection, take antibiotics and steroids and vitamins, and do all sorts of nasty things to try to get better. But 1.5 degrees is not much, is it? And despite playing in the snow or diving under the ice and shivering like a jackhammer in an East Rand gold mine and climbing mountains in 30 degree heat and sweating like the fountains in Pretoria, my body temperature has not fluctuated by that amount from any of those activities, ever. If it did, I'd be sick and have to stop. Now, can you imagine yourself in those or similar situations? And think of if, if your body temperature had changed. It didn't, did it? Uh-uh. It remains static. Have you ever wondered how the body can do that? And that is homeostasis, and that's what we're going to talk about here. Now, let's go play on the frozen sea, shall we? Okay, I'm kidding. Now, we can think of homeostasis as, as a tendency of an organism or cell to regulate its internal conditions usually by a system of feedback control, so as to stabilize health and functioning, regardless of the outside changing conditions, whether it's freezing cold like the snow on the left, or boiling hot like the sun on the right. Now the word homeostasis is derived from the Greek, <clears throat> homeo, or same, and stasis, or stable. <clears throat> and its literal meaning is something like remaining stable or remaining the same. Of course, if you write that down as the meaning of homeostasis on a test, you won't get any marks because you need to give the real practical meaning of homeostasis. Now, we're going to look at thermal regulation, water and salts, carbon dioxide and oxygen, and glucose. And we're going to start with glucose because that will be review for you. Because remember, we covered glucose under the endocrine system. Now... To understand homeostasis, you need to understand the concept of negative feedback. Now, if you've ever been in an air-conditioned room on a hot day, you've seen an example of negative feedback in action. Imagine the temperature being below the normal room temperature because the air conditioner was on. The thermostat senses this and switches the air conditioner off. And the temperature rises back up again. Maybe it rises up to normal room temperature, or maybe it's a hot day outside, really hot day outside, and the temperature rises and continues to rise and goes above normal room temperature. Again, the thermostat senses this and switches the air conditioner back on to cool it back down again to normal room temperature. And thus, the temperature of the room is maintained within a narrow range, assuming, of course, that everything is working correctly. Now... Looking at this from the perspective of normal room temperature, let's move to the perspective of normal blood glucose. Now imagine that the blood glucose level rises. Maybe you've eaten something sweet or you've eaten something starchy. Now, the equivalent of the thermostat sensor 
is actually in the pancreas cells themselves. And they detect that the blood glucose levels have risen. Insulin is released. Glucose is taken up and used and stored in glycogen. This decreases the level of uh, glucose in the blood and the normal blood glucose levels are restored. So here we again see the negative feedback loop. Now let's look at it from the perspective of blood glucose falling. The blood glucose level falls, the pancreas cells detect this again, and they release glucagon. Glucagon leads to glycogen being converted in the liver into glucose. This is released into the blood, and the blood glucose level increases, and the blood uh, glucose levels are re uh, restored to normal again. And this is essentially a similar kind of situation to what happens with the thermostat and the air conditioner. Now, this negative feedback, if anything happens to it, if it fails, then we end up with an illness. And in the case of glucose, that is diabetes mellitus. Now, let's look at thermal regulation. or how we regulate the temperature of our own bodies. Now, before we talk about uh, how we regulate temperature, just bear in mind that there's two kinds of ways in which organisms uh, deal with body temperature. One is called ectothermy, and the other is called endothermy. Ectothermy and endothermy. Ectothermy is sometimes called poikilothermy, and endothermy is sometimes called homeothermy. Now let's look at each of those, and in particular, because we're hom homeotherms or endotherms, we're going to look at this one in more detail. Now an ectotherm is an organism whose internal heat production is relatively small, so its body temperature is actually determined by the surrounding environment. Now because the surrounding environment temperature varies, many ectotherms have varying uh, body temperatures in, as well, and so they're often referred to as poikilotherms, which means that their body temperature varies. But some ectotherms are actually able to behaviorally adjust where they sit, and so maintain a fairly stable body temperature in spite of the fact that they're ectotherms. And so the notion that all ectotherms are poikilotherms is perhaps not strictly correct, and so biologists tend to talk about ectothermy rather than poikilothermy these days although you still see poikilothermy in many textbooks. Now, invertebrates are all ectotherms, fish are ectotherms, and reptiles and amphibians are also ectotherms. Endotherms are organisms that produce heat internally through various mechanisms. <clears throat> they are able to maintain a constant body temperature in spite of temperature fluctuation in the surrounding environment, and they don't need, usually, behavioral mechanisms to do it. And for this reason, they're also called homeotherms, meaning that their body temperature is the same all the time. Birds are endotherms, and mammals are endotherms. And us being mammals, we are, of course, endotherms as well. Now, let's think about us and how we maintain our body temperature, our own thermostat and air conditioning system that we have built into our bodies. So, let's look at body temperature. A typical human body temperature is around 37 degrees, plus or minus a tiny little bit, about half a degree or so. And if it fluctuates outside that, then it's considered to be a problem and we are likely to be ill. Now, our body has in the hypothalamus a set point for the body temperature. And that set point is around 37 degrees. And whenever the temperature of the body fluctuates away from 37 degrees, the set point is triggered and the body takes action, much like the thermostat turning on the air conditioner or the heater to bring the body back to normal uh, body temperature. So, let's look at how our own body's air conditioner works. If it's cold, we know we shiver, much like I'm sh kind of shivering right now. If it's hot, we sweat. We know about this. We also have remnants of a mechanism that probably was much more useful back in the days when our, when our ancestors had much more hair than we do, and that's pillow relaxation, the flattening of the hairs. That helps cool us down. Vasodilation, the expansion or the increasing the thickness, the, sorry, the diameter of the veins 
of the blood vessels uh, in, in the skin. And those blood vessels in the skin, when they increase in diameter, more heat can be lost from the skin. And that helps cool us down. If it's cold, we also do the opposite pillow erection, erecting of hairs. Again, something that was probably more useful to our ancestors. Oh, and by the way, pillow erection is, is also uh, known as getting goosebumps. We also show vasoconstriction, particularly of the blood vessels in the, in the skin, and that uh, keeps blood away from the skin and keeps it from close contact with the cooler conditions of the environment and helps retain heat in the body. And we can also burn fat, particularly brown fat, which is spe specifically uh, designed to be burned to help us uh, keep warm when it's cold. So, normal body temperature is in this range, 35.6 to 37.8 degrees, <clears throat> so it's 37 plus or minus a little bit. Now what happens if our body temperature increases? For example, we're doing a lot of exercise or the weather is hot. This activates the heat loss center in, in the hypothalamus based on the set point, the temperature at which our body is considered normal, around 37 degrees. The blood vessels of the skin dilate, allowing more, more heat, uh, bl heated blood to get near the surface of the skin and so heat exchange happens. Pillow relaxation, it, it thins down the, uh, the layer of hair, allowing more heat to escape. And of course, the most obvious one that we know about is sweating. Sweat glands secrete perspiration, and the perspiration evaporates from the skin, giving us evaporative cooling. And all of these things together brings the body temperature back down, and we end up with going back to our normal body temperature. At this point, the heat loss center is, is, uh, is detects that the body temperature is normal and it switches off all these, these air conditioning uh, mechanisms. Now, what happens if it's cold and the body temperature is decreased? For example, if we're outside in cold weather, like me sitting around on the ice, ice fishing, or standing out on the ice in the middle of the ocean, dropped off by a helicopter and shivering while I'm waiting for the helicopter to pick me back up again. Well... This activates the heat promoting center of the hypothalamus, again based on the set point of the body temperature <clears throat> normally being around 37 degrees. So this is like switching on the heating uh, component of the air conditioning. In this case, uh, the blood vessels constrict, um, that re removes the, uh, the warm blood from, from the skin and holds the, body, uh, holds the heat uh, contained in the blood closer into the body core preventing uh, heat loss. Our skeletal model muscles are activated, and this is what shivering is. We also get pillow erection, the hairs standing up um, on our skin, and again, something that was probably more useful to our ancestors. Uh, today we call that goosebumps. And all of these things taken together bring the body temperature back up, and so the normal body temperature is restored. And that is a very good example of a negative feedback mechanism, and it is very similar to the negative feedback mechanism that uh, we talked about with respect to the air conditioner. Now, if the mechanisms of thermoregulation fail for some reason, we can have an increase in body temperature called hyperthermia. Hyperthermia. In this case, the body produces or absorbs more heat than it can dissipate. And this is due to a... And this produces an elevated body temperature. This can be caused by, for example, heat stroke when you're outside and you're exercising and it's a hot day and you just simply can't lose uh, heat as fast as you're building it up. You get into a situation called heat stroke. Um, it could also be caused by adverse reactions to drugs. And it's important to know that hyperthermia is not the same as having a fever. A fever is caused by the physiological increase in the body's temperature set point. In other words, the thermostat is turned up. Hyperthermia is when the body temperature overshoots the thermostat. And hyperthermia is sometimes induced medically for certain treatments such as cancer. Uh, and drugs are used for that purpose. Now, the opposite of hyperthermia is hypothermia, something that we perhaps are more familiar with. <clears throat> hypothermia is a condition 
in which the core temperature of the body drops below the required temperature for normal metabolism, and this is around 35 degrees centigrade. Colder than that, and that's only two degrees below what you consider normal. Colder than that, and you're in trouble. Uh, and this happens, for example, if you're exposed to cold and the internal mechanisms are unable to replenish the heat that is being lost. Let's say you fall into cold water and you can't get out. Uh, hypothermia is a real danger. Uh, people who spend uh, sleep outside in the winter uh, are in real danger of hy uh, hypothermia as well. And people who fool around in, in the winter by playing in the water and playing on the ice, yeah. Uh, it's characterized by mental confusion, uncoordinated movements, uh, decreased heart rate, and decreased respiratory and metabolic rates. Now those last two uh, have some medical use as well. And so sometimes hypothermia is induced medically uh, for certain treatments, for example, during complex surgery, like open heart surgery. Now, that covers, pretty much covers uh, what we need to know from the, from the South African uh, curriculum perspective on the concept of thermoregulation and glucose regulation. Uh, we've got a couple more concepts that we're going to bring in under homostasis, but if you're interested in taking this further, you could, for example, search Google or another search engine and use terms like negative feedback, uh, glucose regulation, homeostasis, hom homeostasis. I keep mispronouncing that word for some reason. It's in my brain that way. Um, human homeostasis, thermoregulation, and any of the other terms that we've talked about here. Uh, you might look for some videos on YouTube. You might pop into the, into the library and read up on this. And if you do find something good using Google or YouTube, please do uh, embed the videos in the wiki or uh, post links on the wiki to what you find on Google. And that's all for now. Uh, I'm Derek Keats, and this resource is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution License. Bye for now.